From cars to handphones to everyday processes, we experience it almost every minute in some form, and yet we don't realize its impact and how much the present has improved and the future could be impacted by it. Hello and welcome to this special discussion on automation acceleration in the new normal. We're joined by an eminent uh, panel here, Chitra Shingre, uh, who is an IMA alumnus, is currently the independent director at ICEX. With over 28 years of experience in banking and capital markets, she's been the MD at JP Morgan Chase as well as Deutsche Bank. She's also worked with ABN AMRO for over 12 years, setting up and heading the global transaction banking business, and has also now been a part of the setup team at NSC for the startup uh, space. Uh, she's also been part of the CCIL, INR, USD, multilateral clearing and CLS offering to the entire banking industry. Uh, she's also involved in uh, several market reforms in the capital markets and mutual fund industry. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Chitsa, today. Thank uh, you. We're also joined by Rohan. Rohan is a CEO at Light Information Systems, a leading player in cognitive process automation and AI startup. Uh, he has held senior leadership roles at the Bank of America, Credit Suisse, and Wipro BPS, where he was involved in strategy, operational excellence, and risk management. At Bank of America, he has led some of the projects around customer analytics and uh, information management, as well as project management office. Uh, it is all of these and more that he brings uh, with over two decades of experience in the customer service and technology operations now to the startup world. Rowan, thank you so much for joining this discussion. Thank you, George. San Sanjay Upal is a founder and CEO of Singapore-based AI Envision FinTech, uh, FinBots. Uh, it was founded in 2017. And the firm was recently also recognized among the top 10 fintechs in Singapore at the Mass Fintech Awards 2020. Uh, a veteran in this space, he was also the founder and CEO of Straits Bridge, a Singapore-based specialist consulting firm bringing leading edge services to financial institutions across Asia, Middle East, and Africa. Sanjay, uh, over 29 years of experience in across financial services, uh, leadership roles and board roles at global and regional banks. Uh, his financial career, in fact, also spans as the group chief financial officer at the Emirates NBD Bank, the group CFO at the Hong Leong Bank in Malaysia, and the CFO for Taiwan, Philippines, and the UAE at the Standard Chartered Bank, uh, as well as the global head of strategy and wealth management at the Standard Chartered Bank. Well, Sanjay, thank you so much for joining us too. Well, quite, uh, you know, I mean, the, the length of each person's uh, profile actually, you know, showcases how, how experienced the profile uh, of this discussion itself as well. Uh, on a lighter note, I mean, I, I know all of you come from very serious industries, but, you know, Pixar's volume is probably the most advanced and yet subtle representation of tomorrow land, right? Where uh, humankind has grown fat and redundant and while machines even brushed our hair and transported us everywhere. Uh, well, it, it yet seems to be a long road, a long road, Chitra, but, uh, you know, you led a lot of uh, you know, project ideation in the automation space and especially in the financial services space, uh, where, where we've seen adoption almost quickened by a decade. How do you see this and how real is it become and how is this, you know, how do you see the future of automation in the current scenario? So it's, it's actually gained momentum and I would say acceleration in the last, uh, you know, one and a half years post the COVID scenario, it actually actually gained more, more momentum than before. But even before that, I would say in the last uh, five to eight years, all of us in the banking industry have always had, have been posed with this, you know, uh, uh, with this problem of uh, having too many people, having too many processes, one process not talking to another. Most of our banks have had a lot of uh, mergers as well. So there are different systems, each of them not talking to each other. And, you know, that's the reason why we just, you know, it, it, it kind of laid the stone to have uh, more of these digitized, so more of these manual processes. And if you actually walk into a bank, you'll see a whole lot of manual processes. Whether it's a bank, financial industry as a whole, you'll see most of the process, while we call ourselves having the best of systems, yet a lot of processes are very, very manual. So, you know, the, the whole thing started with trying to automate all these manual processes and that's where it took birth in terms of, you know, getting most of it into a digitized. Uh, so earlier we used to have these ledgers and all of that, and all of that got into the digitized form. We never thought we could do utilities through a net banking, right? That's something that happened in the last 10 years or 10, 12 years, which is, which is kind of given us the fillip 
as a banking industry to try and automate whatever we can and make it easier for the customers. It's all a customer demand, a customer delight, and also competition, severe competition. As you see, most of the countries are overbanked. Uh, there are there are a mix of local banks, foreign banks, private banks, each one vying with each other for the same piece of the pie. And as a result, the one who is able to cater to the client faster, time is of essence for uh, the uh, uh, you know the quality of service. Customer service is the real differentiator, and that's actually that led to a whole lot of automation. Coming back to digitization, especially on the RPA front, uh, most of uh, the banks have huge resources and it becomes very difficult to kind of manage in crisis in crisis ridden uh, times like COVID. And that's when we thought rather than throwing bodies whenever there are huge pressures, it's better to get the process automated as much as you can. And that's where, you know, the RPAs and, uh, you know, the robotics process automation actually they gain a lot of momentum. So while I was in JP, I remember, uh, you know, we were given a target, you know, it's not just the headcount piece, but in order, you know, we, we were given a laundry list of what all that we need to achieve in the year uh, using RPA and, uh, you know, it was kind of a very stiff target. And uh, once we actually went into it, it make, make, became a lot more easier. Initially, there is that resistance to the board, but I think once you start working with it, we also realized that the 6i and so many other regulatory requirements that we have in terms of process, processes became a lot more easier so i think it's 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 actually benefited us uh, having started early uh, most of the banks are already started on the automation piece so i think the covid piece was uh, the covid times were ma managed much better it's only become uh, you know it's only become the norm of the day now to get more and more into the digitized space yeah Probably also where I think uh, Sanjay would have uh, drawn inspiration from when he set up, uh, you know, everything to do with bots and, uh, you know, could you take us through the journey, uh, Sanjay, because that would draw parallels from your banking career, a legacy banking career to, you know, where uh, legacy banks earlier competed with other legacy banks and then came the fintechs and changed the entire game. Uh, how do you see that space and where do you see the opportunity coming through uh, the different sectors there? Uh you know, it's been quite interesting in terms of the transformation of banking sector as a whole. I started my first banking job nearly 30 years ago. If you look at how the technology has evolved since then, it's just amazing. Uh, you know, just as Chitra mentioned that, uh, you know, a lot of automation was achieved, but we still had a lot of manual elements. The challenge with a lot of traditional automation has been that you need a process that's completely replicable to be able to automate it so that the same thing happens over and over again. What was left out is where we needed multiple systems to interact. Processes to be done differently in different situations, and that couldn't be automated previously. Is the role of AI. The role of AI to come in and recognize the task and then accordingly automate that process or respond to it, actually has just become the next level of automation we're seeing in financial services. A lot of areas that traditionally weren't, you know, automated because the nuances of transactions or nuances of business processes for different situations is now getting addressed. And you're seeing that the quality of that work, but also at the same time, the pace at which it happens is just astounding. So it's getting a lot more intense in terms of the kind of work we see, the pace at which we happen. And you know, one of the examples that we had picked up was credit scoring, which lies at the heart of credit management for retail, SME lending. And what we can say is that the traditional methods were like doing an X-ray to determine uh, credit quality. But what you do with AI today is almost like an MRI. So you get a lot more intense insight, you get it a lot more rapidly. And you're able to bring that directly back into the... The second aspect is, and again, you know, I'll touch upon what Chitra mentioned is, you know, banks are going to growing, you know, adding more and more technologies and systems over the years, and they bring in different systems. The API-driven architectures have enabled the kind of ability of these technologies to talk to each other. Previously, we literally had to create bridges or sometimes just to manually bringing these information pieces together. So the technology has evolved where a lot of our legacy challenges that we had learned to live with over the last couple of decades are now getting solved. Very interesting points that you made, Sanjay. And in fact, uh, just drawing that parallel to, you know, the space that Rowan is currently in, Rowan, uh, you know, you see a lot of these examples that, you know, keep cropping up all 
all day, each day long. And, you know, if you could just take us through your journey too, and then, you know, we could weave in the stories together on, you know, what's the future of automation. But where do you see this going, uh, uh, Rohan? And, you know, how do you bring bring a parallel from the space that you're currently, you know, researching? And there's a lot of innovation that you're working on in this space as well. Yeah, thanks, George. And, uh, you know, taking off from Chitra and uh, Sanjay, right? I mean, they actually covered the whole space. I mean, and I've been part of the same space. I've been part of the banking industry. And prior to banking, I've been in manufacturing where I actually wrote code, uh, you know, in COBOL and then moved on to ERP. So I've actually seen the whole movement where in the initial days, what we were looking at was to automate itself, you know, but more than automation, we were looking at, you know, getting systems in place, ensuring the data is in the right repositories so that you could take the right decisions. Now, rightly, as Sanjay put it, you know, we have moved really fast, really quickly, and we're looking at cognition which I think even Sanjay's firm does. And my firm is actually at the leading edge of, of cognition because uh, we are a multi, multi-function cognitive agent uh, you know, process automation company. And what, what happens and what I see, I mean, I, I, I'll give you, you know, stuff that actually happens with me because I work with a lot of banks, a lot of financial services. And the first thing that everybody comes to me is that you know, we have got RPA in place, which is you know, a routine you know, a process which you, you know, t- do it time and time again and you can kind of, you know, move into the RPA space and you can, you know, take off human beings from that. Now, you don't really take off human beings from that. The RPA continues as it is. But can we move to another level? Can, can this value chain move where we can bring in cognition, where we can bring in intelligence to what is being done and then, you know, take it forward where executive decisions can be taken? So I think that's the same space that uh, FinBots is in. So, uh, and, and so is NLP bots, the uh, light information systems. So just to give it to you, I mean, you know, I've been part of the enterprise. You know, I've gone into this journey with with a startup, you know, right? Uh, for a couple of years, I've been with uh, Light and uh, I've been seeing this process where a lot of the data that is there inside uh, enterprises is structured and there's unstructured data as well. But there's a lot more of unstructured data where you really can, you know, define as to what, you know, what needs to be done with that. Now with cognition coming in, AI coming in, that data can be, you know, uh, tested, that data can be pulled in, you can you know, analyze that and you can, you know, have executive decisions on that. So the speed at which this is moving is, is, is phenomenal. Secondly, uh, you know, uh, with COVID coming in, right, this uh, company is just, you know, had, had a big problem. Everybody, I mean, I don't know one company that did not face an issue with the, uh, with the pandemic. And the first thing, I mean, the calls that I would get is, Rowan, is it possible for us to do any work without humans? Because we can't bring people into office right now. And you know we need to ma- we need to make sure our processes are in place. And a lot of these companies were actually you know going down because because you know they just didn't have any way of going forward. But with you know artificial intelligence and uh, and cogn- cognition, we could actually do this work. And maybe later uh, during this session, I'll I'll probably run you through one of the use cases. So that's that's for me. Well, so uh, we're taking a cue there. It is more and more industry that we're talking about, and COVID actually having accelerated the acceptance of automation in in industries that we probably didn't even think about would pick this up, right? I mean, and that's the example that we're seeing. If, if there are any such examples that you know you could draw in Sanjay, uh, and especially with you know everything from pharma industry, you know, uh, bringing in drug algos which could quicken the acceptance and bringing in to market for drugs. To you know, alternate life sciences, etc. How do you see the entire piece running? Well, one that came from my industry of media and technology was around you know bots actually writing content pieces once you put in a topic. So you know, all of this is 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 this going to change you know the scenario entirely? I think there are, there are kind of interesting facets uh, that have become more center stage in the last year and a half, and uh, some of them actually existed before that. But you know, either there was a bit of denial saying, well that technology will have to wait for a few years or there was just a reluctance or fear. And what has happened is organizations have just got pushed to test the boundaries on what can work for them. So I think so, one of the most interesting things that we've seen, and especially you know, because our work relates a lot with both consulting and advisory on the domain side, as well as technology, is that all our work used to happen at client locations. So which means we had to fly down teams and they'd be sitting at client offices and working through for months and quarters and sometimes a couple of years. What actually kind of came through in the last 18 months is, and especially we've kind of kicked this off in about September last year, is after a lot of reluctance and having done a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, prototyping, 
organizations have accepted that a huge amount of automation can be delivered remotely. So to give you an example, we are, we are currently running our projects in a few countries without a single person from our team being on the ground. And in fact, our teams are spread between our offices in Singapore, Dubai, and India. And I think that's kind of changed the entire manner in which the you know, we are delivering services, but also how the clients expect. So I'm talking about a complex project. I'm talking about for a bank for nine countries, we've implementation, implemented a system to bring in, extract data on real-time basis, you know, 24 seven running that. That entire implementation was done remotely. We did an advisory piece for another bank, uh, one of the largest banks in Indonesia. Traditionally, this would require the entire team to be sitting there, but we had a team that was between all our three offices and running this remotely. I think the interesting piece this saw was that traditionally, you know, uh, some of these long range projects that would require people to be away for considerable time. We did have some people who couldn't join these teams previously, you know, both men and women uh, because of personal constraints. And as a result, the teams were constructed differently. Today, when they're able to work from, you know, their homes or their base locations and offices, it's just amazing, not only, you know, how we deliver the outcomes to our clients, but also, the constitution of our teams and suddenly the people who would not be able to work on certain projects because it would require them extensive travel are now part of the project and not just part in some cases they are actually leading those initiatives so i think it's just a matter of how we are bringing in various elements of technology to continue enablement so rohan talked about it and you're right uh, there were organizations that literally froze last year they had no idea i can't get anybody in office how do i get any work done and that acceptance of remote access, remote enablement, while ensuring security is something that's becoming increasingly, I would say, you know, accepted now. And just and that problem. Uh, sorry. No, no, sorry. no, go on, Ron. Yeah, so just no, no, go on, Ron. Well, as Sanjay mentioned, right? One of the things that actually struck me is, you know, the the women population that is actually out there, which goes to work, right? I mean, that's a very, very small percentage, and I think that number has been beaten down. Now we are actually into those houses, right? Where women are at home and now they have access to technology, they have access to system, they have infrastructure where they can actually be part of this, uh, this journey, right? Where, where they, can, they can easily, you know, upskill and upgrade and, you know, get, get into the system. I had a conversation once uh, at the bank where one lady, and this is just before, uh, this, was, this would be in 2018, where, you know, the, uh, one lady came up to me and asked me, you know, is it possible that we can work from home? Why is it that I always need to be in the office inside these four walls? When I have the skill set, I have, you know, all the knowledge that you need and I can deliver the same thing, maybe at lesser time and I have needs at home. Now, you know, you, you fast forward to what we are in currently, we are all at home. I don't know one single man that's out there that doesn't have to do something at home, right? So, you know, so th this thing actually has been more than a bane, it's actually a boon. Just look at how things have changed, right? I mean, and what it can do to our uh, organizations itself in, in, in the capacity of diversity. I mean, uh, women having to step out of workplaces, not being able to take, you know, larger responsible roles because they've got commitments at home. Uh, how are things going to change? And, you know, there are only very few people on boards. And, you know, I mean, Chitra, you have been a stellar example of how, you know, growth can really come in uh, while you balance different things. How is this going to really change the diversity quotient in organizations and how do we see the future of work actually going to be, uh, uh, you know, redefined through automation? So when I started off and or when I, I was having a baby, I was actually the only woman amongst about, say, 50 male uh, colleagues. So women are far and few in finance at that time. And, you know, things have really changed. And I think we women have ourselves contributed to making it much better for the uh, next generation of women to come into the workforce. Right. And so uh, apart from, um, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the flexible hours and uh, that that we offer to, uh, you know, new mothers or people who are who are needing to take care of who are the caregivers at home who are parents who are not you know who need to be taken care at home or who are actually pursuing another higher education etc it's become a lot easier now within the organizations we offer them flexible hours and now with this you know with this remote work which is now become acceptable i mean it was it wasn't acceptable so much in the banking industry up until covid i would say one off you could actually say i'm working from home but this kind of coming that having that continuous connectivity with your 
systems and able to actually do what you do within the office, like approving transactions and actually putting in transactions. I think that's become a big boon, as he said. It's not a bane, but a boon, as as Rowan said. It's going to make a lot life a lot easier, especially for the. I wouldn't just call it only for the women folk. There are a lot of male folk who are also wanting these flexibility because there are caregivers at home. They may have elderly parents who need to be taken care of. So I think it's it's become a lot better for the working folk. And um, you know, with with uh, a lot of these AI that Sanjay was talking about, and we're all into AI. I mean, AI is the new buzzword in the banking industry. You know, everybody talks about AI now. Anything that you want to do, the system doesn't do. They say, oh, can we look at an AI? Can we look at a bot that can do it for us? It's that kind. There's there's so much acceptance. When we started off, you know, trying to get into this transformation journey of five years or say six years back, it was a big pushback from the people who have been in the bank for like 20, 30 years. The traditional bankers are just not comfortable doing anything differently from the way they have done it for the last 30 years. But now, with you know, with COVID and these, you know, you shouldn't say thanks to pandemic, which, uh, but I think you should say thanks for various other reasons as well. But I think it has really opened up and made people realize that you need to become, you know, more acceptable to you, act, you know, doing things differently and not the traditional way of doing banking. So the digitization is an accepted norm now. Else, I have gone to meetings where the only job was to con convince the shake stakeholders to kind of accept getting into the digital journey. So I think that's that's a big plus. I remember technology companies uh, probably citing this as a classic example of you know having to come for multiple pitch uh, uh, you know, meetings just to explain what could be done through yeah. automation and, you know, not, not being accepted. The second part of it was the industry accepting it, but then the regulator not being convinced. So has that also changed, Chitra, because you've driven a lot of those conversations to regulators and that too, you know, the specifically very difficult industries like, uh, you know, with yeah. mutual fund industry, etc. So how have things actually remodified and, you know, rechanged for, you know, consumers to, you know, better accept and to make it much more easier? So even in a pandemic, uh, those became the essential services, the stock exchanges, the stock clearing houses, the mutual fund houses, because the markets were on and they had to be at work. But then I think as regulators, uh, it's become a lot easier. They don't summon us to their office. Now we can do a Zoom call. That's become an accepted norm with them, which I feel is the start. Uh, I think they have become a lot more uh, open to the idea of doing things uh, in a more automated way. Of course, they are. Uh, you need to convince them. They it need to be proven to them with a small pilot saying that you know it doesn't disrupt, it doesn't trouble the. I mean, it doesn't disrupt the trading or doesn't disrupt the clearing, nor does it disrupt the uh, the customer or the broker or all those entities that are involved in a transaction. I think once you once you are able to make that pitch to them, there is a lot more acceptance at what was before yes well rowan was you know when we were discussing this offline uh, you gave us that example of you know, a you know the government agency reaching out to you and desperately asked you know seeking for things to be automated uh, especially you. with with uh, you know vaccination etc being uh, dispersed as well uh, you know how you know how is this seep down to the the ground root level and how do you see acceptance coming in quicker yeah, see, India, as we know, is, you know, it's it's a huge population that we deal with here. And the minute a pandemic like this happens in a country like ours, I mean, there is, uh, you know, it's, it's hell to pay, really. I mean, it's, it's not easy. There are, and, and like we all know, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs, I mean, at, at the lower levels, and they needed to get back to their, to their states, right? I mean, where they could at least have a decent living. So now when something like this happened, I mean, uh, and, and the new rules got passed where, you know, they had to get, uh, get get a card from the police station saying that okay you're you're fit to travel or you, you can go. Uh, there was a rampage there where you know people were all queued out and so that's that's how you know uh, what happened is you know we got a call from uh, from from the Pune police and uh, we immediately went in there and the surprise that I actually had was that uh, they had a full fledged tech team right there you know which was ready you know all we needed was an API from them to be able to you know give them a platform so that they could uh, inculcate. The, uh, you know the, the AI in there so the reason being what what they really needed is they wanted to know whether the people that were traveling from one state to the next were genuine or not because every single person was was going in there so we could actually help filter this for them so that's you know that's how the sudden acceptance came in because there was no other way I mean I you know uh, the technology was the only savior at that point and I the way I see it technology is the only savior going forward as well so yeah, that's uh, that's a good example there for for you, and 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 this is not just uh, 
them. I mean, if you if you look at what happened uh, with NASCOM, there, there's a uh, site that came up called India AI, and it was getting promoted by the government. And a lot of you know uh, fledgling companies actually came through. So there are a lot of startups on that page. If you if you have a look at it, and there was a lot of promotion that actually took place, and MSMEs got benefits through through that. So you know, it not only uh, you know was the need of need of the hour for you know governments to actually you know step in there and and pull in the technology that was there. It was it it was also you know uh, essential that uh, you know they help the smaller companies to also come through. So in, in a way, uh, the economy as we know is in a very bad shape, but it would have helped them to a certain extent. In fact, it's interesting that you brought in that point, Ron, because uh, you know uh, democratization in automation itself was a huge need, right? Uh, apart from those large three or four companies holding on technology, holding and bringing in new innovations in the technology, uh, just being able to democratize more and more younger companies, fledgling companies coming, and we also seeing a lot of VC interest in this space. I mean, uh, the last IPO UiPath was talking about 38 billion and plus. But we're also seeing existing players like SAP, et cetera, coming up with uh, you know acquisitions in this space too. Uh, how do you see the space shaping up, Sanjay? And you know, especially interest from both VCs bringing in, uh, you know, more development in technology. But then, obviously, that cannot happen unless you have more people or more universities in India actually bringing this up as a topic of, you know, interest for kids to, you know, pick up and study about. Very good points, uh, George. I think what's changed in technology. You touched upon an interesting point there. Previously, if any major innovation had to happen, you know, leveraging technology, it was typically the big firms. You know, you had to be a firm with $500 million, billion dollar revenue. You could then invest in those capabilities and build those huge platforms. Today, it is just amazing how their startups, their fintechs, literally barely a couple of years old, who are able to bring together the right technology and create very much similar capabilities, much cheaper, much quicker and actually a lot more responsive in terms of the quality and a lot more flexible in terms of how they interact in any team, you know, organization's environment in terms of interacting with their legacy system. And at the same time, it's literally, you know, making it user friendly. And my favorite example is, you know, how a lot of complex technology is taking its cue from smartphones, right? Smartphones have enormous technology, the kind of work Okay, able to do with our various apps is amazing, but none of us needs to be a STEM qualified individual or a PhD or a master's in engineering, etc., to use them. And I think you're seeing technology that's enabled that kind of, you know, uh, rapid development process, but at the same time make it easy for the user to be able to apply the, you know, usage as opposed to get needing to, you know, get into the engine room. And I think that really is a huge enable that, enablement that's happening. VCs have the interest because they realize that what traditional large technology firms did over a decade is something that could be enabled in a matter of months or maybe a year, year and a half by smaller firms. And therefore the entire kind of competitive landscape has changed and VCs are you know, acknowledging that there is a better nimbleness in some of the smaller organizations who basically are essentially lacking just the financial strength. So if you provide them the financial strength, you could see, and we have seen some of these companies literally become significant players in the global market in a very, very short span of time. So I think that disruption in the entire technology industry is happening as we see, and it's only going to get more intense. Just like some of the fintech players are pushing, you know, the traditional banks into a very different kind of challenge, we're seeing the same thing happen in the technology industry. But do they also come with hiring, uh, uh, you know, uh, hiring challenges too? Because do you find the kind of candidates you're looking for, especially in, in your space of bots, et cetera, where you're constantly mm -hmm. looking for innovation? No, that, that's a really great point. Uh, I think there's the, the, the fight for talent is ongoing. And uh, what we are seeing, so if I would just look back in our hiring over the last four or five years, I think the number of individuals available in you know, areas like data science, machine learning, et cetera, is a lot more than what it was then. You're seeing a lot more youngsters going in there. Not only that, I think today, the entire pursuit is of learning rather than degrees, right? So 
people are pursuing their degrees, et cetera, pursuing the formal education, but very often if the formal education doesn't include these elements, they are doing it on the side themselves, right? So you're able to enroll into a lot of courses online and learn these aspects, do your own development, create your own kind of, you know, different learning environments and pursue that learning as opposed to just saying, well, I have this degree and this is all I can do. And I think that completely widens the horizons for individuals, but also widens the pool that's available to us. The entire kind of modern technology and the importance it's gaining as we see it, I think is driving a lot of people into learning technology. But it's not just people who are saying, well, I need to become a technology developer, et cetera. We are seeing a lot of people in different domains. So they could be in finance, they could be in design, they could be you know, in uh, teaching, et cetera. They are enrolling in programs to learn you know, Java, Python, some of these languages not just because they're going to sit down and you know develop code but the idea is that gives them an idea of the art of possible right so they know the domain well and once they understand the technology they get a deeper impact in terms of what the technology can achieve for their domain so i think the entire pursuit of learning has come in a lot more today you know with all this education and courses being available online than just taking the box of degrees but for somebody who's who's you know hearing this entire you know, discussion right now on automation, uh, for existing individuals who are already holding you know mid level to senior level roles, and for freshers who are looking for an entry into the, this industry, uh, between Rohan and Chitra, if you could suggest what should they be looking at, what kind of you know up learning can they do, or what kind of fields in this space can they actually look out for, where they see a future you know, oriented in one of your organizations or an existing organization where they need people with the skill sets and an understanding of the space? So, uh, you know, I uh, I come with the clear thought that you just, just knowing uh, Python and just knowing this Java languages is not enough. A little bit of domain knowledge is important to actually, actually convert those uh, thoughts that the operations or the banking folks are telling you into that language, right? We most often, my experience the last 30 years is when these geeks come, the tech geeks is that they just know their stuff, right? They just come and they say, they listen to you, but after time, you know, it just goes, it goes by over them they just can't understand the basics of banking so this is what we have also there's a huge amount of orientation that we need to do for weeks together for them to get a hang of what we are trying to tell them so it's both ways right i mean as as banking professionals if you if you tell us things like python python is what it's a snake that's all i know about you know that's the kind of thing that you know and you you also so it's it's both ways what has also happened is that within the organizations uh, what we have also started doing is that some amount of base level I won't call it programming but base level understanding in terms of how these uh, you know processes are actually you know automated and what impact it has on the base level system what is the kind of delivery it happens on the front end system those kind of orientations actually being given even to the operation folks or to the banking folks similar kind of you know orientation is being given to these uh, tech guys but what I have essentially seen I, for example I can give you an example of automation anywhere they were a small company to, to, to pick on what Sanjay was saying. They were a small little company from Baroda. And when JP decided to, when we floated an RFP and we decided to pick a partner, there were two guys who were neck to neck. One was Blue Prism, very well known, established organization of London. They had all the flair and they could, you know, actually bowl you over with their presentations, PowerPoint presentations. And there was this little company called Automation Anywhere from Baroda, five member gang, didn't have any of those, uh, you know, None of those uh, high-handedness or for a small little company, very flexible. He used the word flexible. Very, very important if you really want to be successful as a, as a startup organization. Extremely flexible, willing to move in and be an in-house partner. So, you know, typically these banks, they create the center of excellence COE. There is this operations team. There is this tech team. There's a vendor. And there is this risk and compliance personnel also sitting around. So, it becomes center of excellence. And each of them are able to discuss at the end of the day and thrash out 
there are anything that needs to be uh, you know uh, um, uh, you know discussed so uh, it's not those age old thing where operation sits in one place and tech sits in another place it's all broken now you know those barriers are broken it's all center of excellence everybody is co uh, co located and that kind of brings in a lot of synergy and network and this little team was willing to come into our office base themselves out of mumbai and bangalore understand what we are saying i mean they were willing to extend their working hours from you know a 9 to 5 into an 18 hours kind of a shift and that's exactly what has made them what they are today today they are the most sought after uh, partner for uh, robotics so uh, so and, and what they had they had base level engineers but they were doing a whole amount of training internally in terms of what what is banking what is you know cast how what is customer service how does these transactions happen what are the two pipes how are the global systems connected how do you do the regulatory reporting so even the even the organizations the tech organizations are investing a lot into training which is really the domain training not the tech training so that the people who are actually working on these projects are actually able to you know uh, deliver and actually are, are actually actually able to grasp and able to give you the best solutions that you are looking for as a partner this has been my experience yeah and chitra i think you're spot on 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 this stuff but that snake that you're talking about that's the most important snake and, in the universe right now so if if <laughs> if there are people out there with python skills please call me please reach out to me we're looking for them so yeah yeah so uh, getting back to you know the audience that's out there and uh, probably wants to know you know what's what's the best thing to do uh, like chitra covered and sanjay also covered uh, you know it's uh, degrees are pretty much passe but degrees are important undoubtedly but it's very important to have an open mind to have uh, you know subject matter expertise that's the area that we we are really looking at because you know code now we know is very easily doable right we have no code platforms you anybody chitra you know i can give you my platform and you can work on that and you can create a use case right right there and you have a if you have a problem statement you know you probably you know solve solve some problem or maybe a big problem for example you know uh, i get calls almost weekly you know even even for areas like space tech somebody called me up and said hey you know one can you can you do something in space tech so you can just imagine the yeah, yeah. is limitless so you know so my, my advice to folks is that you know uh, keep an open eye i mean keep uh, looking out for what's happening with technology it's moving at such a fast pace and like sanjay said there are so many platforms out there you can actually take one particular uh, course you know master the course it's it's really important that we get mastery on it and then you purpose your you know and and you figure out where you want to go so that's that's an advice that i would i would put out there for people so so an opportunity definitely for individuals who are already in in sector and you know who's got a domain expertise to bring in automation and on the other hand for technology geeks to look at opportunities here as well well thank you so much uh, you know each one of you uh, just a quick round uh, as we as we kind of conclude so uh, where do you see the immediate uh, future of automation and what new sectors and is there anything additional that you see for individuals who are already existing in in sectors uh, sanjay to pick up this is an opportunity i think uh, in terms of just rounding up the discussion my uh, thoughts are the technology has been around us is here to stay and the pace of evolution and its inclusion into our daily lives is just multiplying and that there are always events that force that upon us sometimes it's just plain vanilla competition sometimes it's you know this is what my neighbor is doing and i need to be able to do the same sometimes because there's a reward associated with it and sometimes there's a pandemic that forces your hand but i think very quickly a lot of us have learned to accept various aspects of technology but also start recognizing the pace at which it's moving and i mean rohan made this point which is you need to take this as the new tool you need to right uh one is you are you know we, we go and get our degrees in the specializations we want but you know we learned how to use typewriters when you know when i was young that was the only device i had through which i could create documents then we learned if anybody remembers you know word star and word perfect and microsoft office coming around and things uh, microsoft excel you know uh, suddenly we're doing our own spreadsheets and mathematical modelings coming back to rohan said no code which means today you are able to take elements of code bind them to uh, together and create your own automation and i think just count it as something that is really important to 
the next stage of all of our evolution, which means we should be able to do that thing exactly the way we are able to type our own emails, create our own documents or our Excel sheets. So I think that's where the focus needs to be. And that also ensures our longevity, you know, in terms of professional relevance. The, you know, one of the things we measure in science is half-life, right? So half-life of professions, which used to be 15, 20 years, is today probably about three to four years. And the idea really is that keeping up with how the market's moving and how it's applying different capabilities is going to keep any one of us professionally relevant. And that becomes really, really important as we go forward. Well, acceptance, of course, has also been the biggest uh, help, as Chitra mentioned, and to you, Chitra, with the regulator accepting the fact that there is a need for automation yeah. and being uh, able to you know, join hands with the industry to look at solutions more openly has, has quite helped. Yeah, it has, and they've become more receptive, uh, you know, to to these ideas, and that that's that's a big win for us as an industry. But as uh, to some of the thoughts that they said, you know, I have uh, so people ask, will fintech and will be in competition to the banks? I said we will coexist. Uh, you know, you have to coexist. One can't do without the other. That's where it has come to now. You know, so we're going to become the best of partners, and it's it's going to be a partnership for a long, long time. And uh, for uh, you know, for the um, uh, people who are aspiring uh, in to get into that kind of space, it will be always nice to, you know, get those certifications done where you go through these small courses. I've seen some of them on AI, which I want to do myself because I want to get, you know, I mean, I would really love to learn and know. And there's no there's no end to learn learning, right? Each day is new. Something new comes up. And which is why I think even as professionals, whether you're a banking professional or a tech professional, it's, get, it's good to get yourself acquainted and uh, um, uh, you know, get get some certifications done, which will always help. At least you understand what what uh, the tech guy is telling you. And the biggest help has also been that learning has become much more accessible today accessible. across the yes. board. Uh, yes. You know, and and from anywhere that we are as well. Um, yeah. Also, you know, coming back to the coexisting piece, uh, Rohan, you know, and with, with the way technology has shaped up, there is no big player, small player uh, market anymore, right? If you've got a solution, you obviously have a market for it. And, you know, especially from your place that you are in uh, and what you're developing, how do you see that space and how do you see VCs, et cetera, accepting this norm to be the future of uh, automation? This space is going to boom. It's going to go through the roof. I mean, we, we're already seeing it. There are so many players and everybody knows, you know, I, I, I don't need to spell it out. There's something known as a unicorn out there. People are looking to be beyond the unicorn. So here, what's happening is, I mean, in the past, we had machines doing work for us. Now, you know, we have machines actually being able to do the same thing that, that we do. So there is going to be co-harmony. There's going to be coexistence between machines and humans. That is the way forward. So, uh, you know, and, and that's the same that I think Pinbots does and LPBots does the same thing. We are into that space for cognition where we are going to that end state where what will happen end of the day is that, you know, the cognition systems will do so much work for you that you will be free to do a lot more than, than you could do before. So a lot of your time that you spent on doing actual stuff there, like in the manufacturing firms, you had no choice. You had to be there in, 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 in those, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, factories, right? Now you don't need to. Now you can have systems in place. But now those systems are getting intelligent. And that's where the, the future lies. Cognition is where the future lies. And uh, VCs are watching the space. Uh, I mean, I, did, uh, I know our company is uh, also, you know, being watched and, and we're doing very, very well, extremely well at this point in time. And we, uh, we hope to be the next big thing that's, that's on, on the block. So, you know, uh, to your point, uh, I, I just, uh, uh, like they say, sky is the limit. I don't think sky is the limit. Already people are getting into space now. And we know Elon Musk and uh, Mark Zuckerberg are already having plans to get there. And, you know, there are some tickets out there, I believe. You know, if you're rich enough, you can go buy them and get onto that flight. But sky is not the limit. Space is the limit now. People so are actually sure telling you. Elon Musk not to come back, huh? That's latest today. <laughs> as long as he gives me a Tesla Chitra, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, drawing in a you know a lot of conclusions here. Uh, uh, thank you so much. It was a fantastic discussion, and you know a lot of takeaways from this. Uh, as conversations continue on with Ace and the platform, uh, well, automation is here to stay. It is going to be a part of every process that we do. Uh, and of course, uh, wishing Rohan and uh, no, Sanjay, when you were speaking about uh, unicorns, et cetera, we'll see your names there as well soon. Uh, and thank you so much, Chitra, with all your experience. Uh, it was a fabulous discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chitra. Thank you.